We're going to go over your Unit 5 packet. So when we look at your standards, these are the things that we underline, the proper nouns, the University of Georgia, Georgia Capitals, land policies, head right system, land lotteries, Yazoo land fraud, <coughs> technological developments, the cotton gin, railroads, William McIntosh, the removal of the creek, John Ross, John Marshall, Andrew Jackson, the Dahlonega Gold Rush, Worcester versus Georgia, the removal of the Cherokees, and the Trail of Tears. So there were 10 things in your packet. Um, we also had the journals that were attached to it. Um, you have your five Georgia Capitals assignment that should be getting finished in classroom and your Quizlet vocabulary also in classroom. So when we look at number two, these were some notes that we took. This was a timeline over Georgia from Confederation to Constitution. So you need to know these dates. The Articles of Confederation were ratified in 1781. The U.S. Postal Service was established in, also in 1781. The Treaty of Paris ended the American Revolutionary War in 1783. The UGA Charter was um, signed by the uh, Georgia legislature that created the University of Georgia. In 1787 was the Constitutional Convention. 1788, the U.S. Constitution was ratified. By 1789, George Washington will become the first president of the United States. So the rebuilding of Georgia's economy happened as small farmers and large planters grew their crops, craftsmen made their goods, and merchants established trade relations. After the Revolutionary War, Georgians, like citizens in other states, became concerned about education, especially for white men. When we look at other things about education, we know that the creation of UGA was very important because in 1785, UGA became the first public university established by a state government, and it set the example for today's American system of public colleges and universities. So I wanted you to label Athens, home of the University of Georgia. So here is Athens, right? The dot represents where Cleveland is. Here is Athens. And so that is all that I wanted you to do for that part. Then we talked about the different capitals of Georgia. There were five capitals of Georgia. And the acronym that we remember is SALMA. And so that stands for Savannah, Augusta, Louisville, Milledgeville, and Atlanta. And these are the years that they became the capital. Yes, for a while, Savannah and Augusta would alternate years, but this is their official date that they became a permanent capital. That was Savannah, 1776, Augusta, 1785, Louisville, 1796, Milledgeville, 1804, and Atlanta, 1868. You do not have to know those dates. You just need to know the order that they were in. So when we look at it, Savannah to Augusta to Louisville to Milledgeville and to Atlanta. So the question, the big question is, why did they move so much? Georgians wanted the capital to be centralized to the population. So as the population of Georgia moves north and west, this is why the capital would move as well. Then we talk about land. Land in Georgia, and let's remember that Georgia at the time will be what is today Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. Georgians moved north and west of the coast. Indians ceded their lands. The word seed means to give up. The state needed to sell the land. Georgia actually gave land away to encourage growth. So one way that they are going to give land away will be the headright system. It began after the American Revolutionary War. Anyone who fought in the war and white men over 21 were eligible to receive this free land and they could get 200 acres of more or more of land. Creek and Cherokee tribes occupied Georgia's western lands. Georgia considered the Indians an obstacle to the state's growth. If American Indians would be, could be convinced to leave the land, white settlers would rush to buy it. Corruption and bribery occurred when dishonest officials ignored the law, limiting grants to 1,000 acres per family. They granted more land than actually existed to land speculators who hoped to make a big profit later. These corrupt practices were known as land fraud. And one land fraud that we talked about was the Yazoo land fraud. So again, this was Georgia in 1795. 
Georgia actually included what's today Alabama and Mississippi. So speculators, these are people that buy land to sell it for a profit later, and four land companies bribed legislatures to pass a bill that sold them huge pieces or tracts of land for an extremely low price. When citizens found out, they were furious. They're going to burn the Yazoo Act on the steps of the Capitol in Augusta at the time. The federal government took the land away from Georgia and eventually created what is today Mississippi and Alabama. Another way that they distributed land, and this time you had to buy the land, was the land lottery. By 1803, a new system distributed land by lottery to give people equal chances. Every white male who had lived in Georgia for a year was given equal chance. A man with a family and a widow with two children were given two chances. So it depended on your family and who you had in your family and your wife and your children depending, depended on how many chances that you got. So here was some vocabulary that we looked at. The headright system granted no more than a thousand acres per family. A land speculator, again, is one who buys property to sell it for a profit. Yazoo land fraud was speculators bribed legislators to get cheap land. The land lottery was land awarded by chance, and the Yazoo area is the land that is Alabama and Mississippi today. Economics. Cotton. Cotton becomes a major crop in Georgia in the late 1700s through the 1800s. Settlers had grown cotton in Georgia's mild climate for years, but did not make much money because it was so difficult to separate the seed from the cotton ball by hand. All that changed when Eli Whitney invented a machine that used rollers, teeth, and brushes that cleaned cotton effectively. While the cotton gin made it easier to separate the seeds from the cotton bowl, Picking cotton was extremely labor-intensive. Plantation owners were faced with a problem. Since their large plantations needed more labor to meet the now-increased demand for cotton, this led to an unfortunate rise in slavery. Slavery will explode across the South. And some questions that we did and that were in your book. Number one, in 1800, cotton production and slave ownership was the lowest. But by 1860, the cotton production and slave ownership was the highest. As more cotton was produced, more slaves were needed, and in the end, it increased slavery. One of the main ways that they would get cotton from market to market was railroads. Railroads were built rapidly in Georgia, especially in the 1830s. Soon, railroad branches crossed the state, contributing tremendously to Georgia's economy. The city of Atlanta has its roots in the railroads. The Western and Atlantic Rail from Chattanooga ended at a town called Terminus, which eventually became Atlanta. Two other railroads met there, leading to the town's growth. If we go and we look at this, we see this Western and Atlantic Railroad that was created. So it went from Charleston out west, and it was here in Atlanta. Another rail line from Chattanooga came down, and this is what created Terminus, which led to the city of Atlanta. Okay? Here are our questions for part one that we've talked about. How did most teenage boys receive an education during the 1700s at home or private school? Why would children in the 1700s not be considered to be truly free to choose their destiny? Boys did what their dad did for a living. Girls prepared to be homemakers or wives. Abraham Baldwin felt about education that everyone should have equal educational opportunities. The significance of UGA that it was the first state charter and it was developed on 40,000 acres of land. Colonists moved the capital from Savannah, Augusta, to be centrally located to the population. They were moving northwest. More land became available after Indians ceded the land. This is why they moved west, and again, it was to be centrally located. The capitals in order, Savannah, Augusta, Louisville, Milledgeville, Atlanta, and the acronym was SALMA. Number 12, why did Georgia begin the headright system to attract new settlers? How much land were settlers given between 200 and 1,000 acres? 
The Yazoo Land Act, Georgia sold land to five land companies that bribed members of the legislature. People became angry because people that had bought the land actually did not own it. Even though Georgia legislatures rescinded the Yazoo Land Act, Georgia lost all the land in what is today Alabama and Mississippi. Georgia had seven land lotteries. Three-fourths of Georgia was given away by land lottery. White men over 18 or 21, depending on the lottery, could be in the lottery to get land. We talked about how cotton would spoil, and so it took so long for the cotton to be clean and seeds to pick it out before it would rot. The cotton gin made cotton production faster by getting the seeds out quickly. It did the work of 50 men. The cotton gin increased the demand actually for slaves and cotton. The railroads were expanded in 1830, they built the city of Atlanta. The two negative consequences of the invention of the cotton gin was that one, it increased slavery, and two, the defense of the institution of slavery was being defended more saying that they really, really needed slaves to help the economy of Georgia. So we had a thinking map about what problems arose when Georgians moved away from the coast. They ran into Indian lands, the capital had to move, land lotteries were unfair sometimes, the loss of land and the Yazoo land fraud, slavery increased, trading overseas decreased, dishonest selling of land, jobs near the ocean went away, the Trail of Tears, which followed by the Dahlonega Gold Rush, and William McIntosh, the leader of the creek, will be murdered by his creek people. Then we had our spotted notes. During the Revolutionary War, many American Indians in Georgia fought as allies of the British. The British promised to return land taken by white settlers if Britain won the war. However, once the war was over, Georgians des desired to push American Indians out. The Creek Nation was prominent in southwestern Georgia and was the most populous tribe in the state. Many white Georgians desired the land the creek used for deer hunting, so they pushed for Indian removal. In 1790, the Treaty of York forced the creek to cede land east of the Ultimogi River to the government. When Georgia ceded the Yazoo lands to the federal government in 1802, the U.S. government created, agreed to remove the American Indians still in Georgia. In 1823, Governor George Troop pressured the federal government to drive the creeks from the remaining land. Interesting part is that the Creek Chief William McIntosh is first cousins with the governor of Georgia. The chief was the son of a Scottish officer and a Creek woman. McIntosh angered the Creeks by siding often with the U.S. government over matters of land. He also believed it was best for American Indians to assimilate to the way of the white men. McIntosh was in favor of changing the traditional Creek lifestyle to one of agricultural production and slaveholding. Most Creeks did not support his abandonment of their customs. McIntosh signed the Treaty of Indian Springs in 1825, which gave up all Creek lands to the government of Georgia. Many Creeks were enraged with McIntosh, and a 200-warrior war party murdered him and several other leaders who had signed the treaty. Nevertheless, by 1827, the Creeks were removed from Georgia and relocated to the wilderness across the Mississippi River.